question. What is the first book in the Bible? Is it A, Genesis, B, Judges, C, Exodus, or D, Leviticus? The first book in the Bible is Genesis. Next for 300 points. How many books are in the Bible? Is it A, 72, B, 60, C, 66, or D, 52? That's right, there are 66 books in the Bible. Next question. This one is for 400 points. How many books are in the New Testament of the Bible? Is it A32, B30, C25, or D27? There are 27 books in the New Testament of the Bible. The next question, also for 400 points. How many books are in the Old Testament? Is it A42, B39, C44, or D37? There are 39 books in the Old Testament of the Bible. The next question for 1,000 points. What is the longest book in the Bible? Is it A, Psalms, B, Proverbs, C, Numbers, or D, Song of Solomon? That's right, the longest book in the Bible is the book of Psalms. The next question for one million points. What is the shortest book in the Bible? Is it A, Job, B, 3 John, C, Luke, or D, Amos? The shortest book in the Bible is 3rd John. The next question for 1 billion points. Which gospel is written by a doctor? Is it A. Matthew, B. Luke, C. John, or D. Mark? of Luke was written by a doctor. The next question for just four points. What does Genesis mean? A. Origin, B. Creation, C. Seven Days, or D. In the Beginning? Genesis means origin. Next question for infinity points. Who is the first woman mentioned in the Bible? Is it A. Sarah, B. Ruth, C. Esther, or D. E.
The first woman mentioned in the Bible is Eve. Now for our last question, worth a bunch of points. Which of these is not a book in the New Testament? Is it A, 1 Corinthians, B, 3 John, C, 2 Thessalonians, or D, 3 Peter? Third Peter is not a book in the New Testament. Thanks for playing Bible Trivia. We hope you'll play again soon. <laughs> well, a good evening. A good evening to uh, all of you. And uh, welcome uh, to our session of Ask the Pastor Bible Study today. And uh, Dan, I think you've won the session. I think you got all the good answers. And Alice Jibichime, you won yourself a whole gallon of gas. <laughs> I think that's what will start. The new currency will be gallons of gas or liters of gas. And uh, hopefully that will also be a way of living. So uh, a good evening to you all. <laughs> and uh, blessings in the name of Jesus. I hope that you guys are doing well. I welcome you to another exciting and hopefully enriching session of Ask the Pastor Bible Study. I am the pastor that is going to be asked questions, uh, and I hope that I will be able to pass the test. And uh, today is just an open forum, which means any question is welcome. Uh, it's an open forum. Uh, excuse me, just one second. I have to close this door that's here that my wife left open. Once. Oops. Oh, was I muted? <laughs> was I talking to myself? Apparently. Uh, okay, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? I'm not sure that you could hear me before. Uh, confirm for me if you can hear me. Okay, I had muted myself when I began the program. Uh, when the... Uh, the previous video was playing, so I do apologize about that. I was just not aware that I had not uh, unmuted myself. So, anywho, uh, now you can hear me. Gladys Stead, she is in the mighty country of Australia, Alice Jebichi, North Carolina, uh, East Coast of the United States. Daniel Sega, right here in the Midwest, the best place to be in the world, uh, not very far from me. Uh, Grady, Grady Risley is in Mexico, enjoying the sunshine down there. Uh, Esther Waiganjos, representing the West Coast, is here. So we have uh, a good representation from everywhere, from everywhere. And we thank the Lord for that. So we already have a couple questions. We already have a couple questions. And uh, uh, the first question here. The first question is by Esther Waiganja says, Hi, Pastor, please talk about spiritual blessings. Please, Pastor, talk about spiritual blessings. And it is followed up by Elias Mukindia, my good friend Muga. Muga Muntoborobe. Yes, uh, Mukindia and I, we might even come from the same region of the world, or at least our ancestors, our forefathers. My grandfather is from Mawa, Meru. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, my uh, 
grandmother was from Buranga. So we mix the kikuyu and the meru. So Elias Mukidia says, what, what is it to pray in the spirit as in Ephesians 6.18? Ephesians 6.18. Uh, we will look at that uh, as our second question. Uh, so let's go. Let's go. Let's begin with the word of prayer, can we? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We give you glory. We give you honor. We worship you. We honor you. Father, we thank you that we can come together to uh, not only worship you and praise you, but also to fellowship in your word, to seek your face, to learn more about what it means to be in the faith and to understand these things better. So, Lord, I bless everyone that is here today. I ask you to, to visit them, to touch them uh, in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. Hold on one second. So, um, so let's begin with the first question. What are spiritual blessings? What are spiritual blessings? Now, Esther, let me say this. In the Bible, there is no such distinction. The Bible does not divide blessings into spiritual blessings and natural blessings. Now, that distinction can be made, but you will not find any verse in the Bible that distinguishes between those things that are physical versus those things that are spiritual when it comes to spiritual uh, to, to blessings. In other words, blessings are blessings. And all blessings come from the same source. All blessings, whether spiritual or physical, come from God. But the Bible does not actually go out of its way to make that distinction. However, because there are spiritual things and because there are natural or physical things, it is easy to make that distinction. So therefore, when we talk about uh, spiritual blessings, we are talking about those things that are immaterial in nature, spiritual in nature, as versus those things which are physical or natural things that we can touch. Therefore, if let's say, for instance, I have, uh, I obtain a house, I might say that is a physical blessing, right? If I obtain a car, I might say that's a physical blessing. But in reality, it is also a spiritual blessing because uh, it came from God. Whatever comes from God uh, is, is, uh, is spiritual, ultimately. But uh, when we talk about spiritual blessing, like for instance, when we want to distinguish them, we talk about those things that make up uh, the spiritual characteristics. For instance, things such as, uh, let's say, righteousness. Things such as spiritual gifts, right? Uh, prophecy or uh, faith or uh, tongues. So these, these things are more uh, intangible. So therefore, when people talk about spiritual blessings, they are talking about things that are intangible. However, like I said, the Bible does not make such a distinction. In other words, if God blesses you with a house, the Bible does not say, well, that's not a spiritual blessing. Okay, all blessings in my view are spiritual, but some blessings will manifest physically. Okay, so in other words, when God reaches, God blesses me with the riches, from his point of view, they are spiritual. But maybe from my point of view, it may be physical. Okay, uh, so uh, just to give you a passage which talks about spiritual blessings, um, we can look at a passage such as uh, 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 Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And we see there in verse number 3, the Apostle Paul said, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy. So he begins to list the spiritual blessings. So the first one he lists is holiness. 
Holiness is a spiritual blessing. Blamelessness is another spiritual blessing. Love are uh, yet another spiritual blessing. Predestination, that's a spiritual blessing. Okay, Adoption. So in other words, these are things which are rooted and uh, are fully manifested in God's presence in the spiritual realms. So we may experience them, and we do experience them in some measure while we are on earth, but the ultimate uh, reception of them, the ultimate uh, enjoyment of them will be in heaven. Okay. So uh, yes, we are adopted. We are children of God by faith while we are here, but we do not get to come to the fullness of that until we enter into heaven. Predestination, right? Our destination is heaven, but we get to know that we are predestined while we are on earth, right? Uh, then we have uh, redemption, redemption, being purchased from the earth so that we can become creatures of heaven. That's a, a spiritual blessing. Forgiveness, again, forgiveness flows from the throne of God, which is in the spiritual realms. Um, he gives others such as wisdom and insight, wisdom and insight. So he's talking about spiritual wisdom, spiritual Insight, uh, what about this one? The mystery of his will. This is also a spiritual blessing. Getting, uh, giving us the knowledge of his will. That's a spiritual blessing. Uh, others are uh, such as, as we go down here, so this is more of a list, right? But it doesn't keep, we put it in the way we do. We do list today, one, two, three, four. But as you read this passage, you see. So in him we have obtained an inheritance. This is a spiritual blessing because our inheritance is in heaven. Our inheritance is not land. Our inheritance is not buildings. Our inheritance is not even our children. Right? Our inheritance is heaven. Eternal life. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, the gospel. It's a spiritual blessing. Because the gospel is a word of God. It's spiritual in nature. Uh, and then we have the Holy Spirit himself. He is a blessing. Right? And of course he speaks about the inheritance again which we will possess when we get to heaven. So these are the kind of spiritual blessings, but there are more, right? If you think about all the attributes of God, all the characteristics of God, um, all the characteristics of God are kinds of spiritual blessings, right? Uh, so joy, peace, goodness, kindness, gentleness, all these things are spiritual blessings. So I don't know if you, have, you had any uh, specific uh, direction you wanted to go with that, uh, Esther. If you do, please uh, follow up and clarify that more. But uh, when I'm thinking about spiritual blessings, those, that's what I would, I would list. But like I said, all blessings come from the same source. So God does not divide blessings and say, well, these ones are, are spiritual and these ones are natural. Blessings are blessings from the point of view of God. Now, the next question is, Elias says, what is it to pray in the spirit? And he gives a quotation of Ephesians 6.18. So we're going to look at Ephesians 6.18 so that we can make sure that uh, our brother is uh, referencing the right verse. I'm not sure that this is where it talks about praying in the spirit. But we will talk about, we will see what it says here, verse 18. Okay, yeah, it is. You're right. You are right. So it says here, uh, now it says praying in the spirit at all times. I still have a little bit of a call, so please uh, bear with me. Okay, so um, now in verse 18, it says praying in the spirit, praying at all times in the spirit. Praying at all times in the spirit. Now, um, and in this particular passage, the Apostle Paul is highlighting the different pieces of the armor of God. Okay, now the armor of God is not uh, is not actually a tangible uh, thing in which the way you, he just uses an illustration, he just uses a metaphor in order to represent the different ways which in which Christ protects us when we are facing spiritual 
uh, conflict, spiritual warfare. So therefore, it's important to start from the beginning so that as you go along, then you'll be able to see by the time you get to verse 18 what it means. So he says, uh, let's begin at verse 10. So he says, finally, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord. Now remember that the Lord is the Spirit. The Lord is the Spirit. So when he's saying he's praying in the Spirit, he's praying in the Lord. Notice that it begins by saying, be strong in the Lord. Then he's going to show you all the different ways that you ought and that you can, and that you can strive to be strong in the Lord. Uh, and in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God. So put on all the protection that God has put in place to protect you, right? Against the schemes of the enemy so that you'll be able to stand. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers uh, over this present darkness. Of course, the present darkness was what was present then, but there are certain ways that it is still present today. Not exactly the same way. But anyway, over the present darkness against spiritual forces in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the day of evil or in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Okay. Now the day of evil was the day of wrath, was the day of judgment, was the day of recompense, was the day of darkness that was upcoming. Okay. Uh, and so he says, stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth. Now the belt of truth is not something that is physical that you can go and buy in a in a in a in a in a Christian bookstore or in a Christian store of any kind. The belt of truth is a principle, right? But the principle is rooted in a person. Jesus said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So when you put on the belt of truth, it means you are putting on Christ. You're putting on Christ. So you will see that each one of these seven items are ways of putting on Christ, okay? Are ways of being in Christ and having Christ in you. So putting on the belt of truth means that you are in Christ and he is the truth and that you stand on the truth and that you live by the truth and that you, you, uh, you, you stand on the foundation of the truth. So that is what it means to fasten the belt of truth, to make a conscious decision to walk by the truth of God, which is rooted in Christ. Then put on the breastplate of righteousness. Um, now, what Paul is doing here, he's using the Roman soldier as his illustration. And the Roman soldier or any soldier of any uh, age, even today, if you look at a soldier, an American soldier, a Russian soldier, any soldier that is well equipped, they'll have all these things. They'll have something on their head. They'll have something to cover their chest. They'll have something on, they'll have a belt which holds all their tools of war. They'll have good shoes and so on and so forth. So the belt of truth is what holds everything together. So in, in the ancient times, that's where the, the sword would be. That's where the knife would be. That's where the water would be, right? A bottle of water and so on and so forth. The breastplate of righteousness, on the other hand, a breastplate was designed like a bulletproof vest to protect the chest area, the organs within the chest, the lungs and the heart and the other uh, you know, organs that are in that area. So putting on the breastplate of righteousness meant that you are protecting mostly your heart, mostly your heart. And of course, righteousness is how you do that. Then you go to the shoes, you go to the feet, Have uh, and, as, and as shoes, for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. So shoes are to protect you and shoes are to enable you to run and to go far. And of course, that's why there is the gospel of readiness, because you are ready to preach the gospel. You are ready to take the gospel as far as it needs to be taken. Okay, so therefore, he's just saying be, uh, be ever ready to preach the gospel. Be ever ready to be called to go wherever it needs to be to, to, to be gone in order to take the gospel far. Then, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. This is 
believe in Jesus. So do you see, the gospel is the gospel of Jesus. The righteousness is the righteousness of Jesus. The truth is the truth of Jesus. The shield of faith is the faith in Jesus. That is what protects you, right? So then it comes to the place where you extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one using that faith in Jesus. And then take on the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation, which of course is supposed to protect your mind. So salvation, the word of salvation, the, the belief in salvation, the understanding, because what is in the head is your brain, your, your, your capacity to understand things. So you must protect your understanding. And so you must understand what salvation is all about. And of course, salvation is about Christ, right? Uh, having the mind of Christ and that kind of thing. And then it comes to the sword of the spirit. This, this uh, corresponds to Hebrews 4.12, where it says that the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, right? Then praying at all times in the spirit. That is the same thing as saying in the Lord. Because the Lord is the Spirit, and the Spirit is the Lord. Now, the Holy Spirit is a person, and we are supposed to be in Him, and we are supposed to be led by Him. So to pray in the Spirit is to be led by the Spirit, is to be guided by the Spirit in the activity of prayer. So to pray in the Spirit is not uh, necessarily, as some would tell you within the Pentecostal uh, part of the church, that to pray in the Spirit is to pray in tongues. Because we can prove quite easily that not everyone who is born of the Spirit and filled with the Spirit speaks in tongues. So to pray in the Spirit is to be guided, to be led by the Spirit. Amen. And then he says, uh, finally, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end, keep alert with all perseverance making supplication for all the saints. And you see, when he says praying at all times in the Spirit, he says with all prayer. That means with all kinds of prayer. So, confession, adoration, thanksgiving, petitions, intercession, all kinds of prayer. And of course, some of them will be with understanding. If you have the gift of tongues, some of them will be in an unknown language. All of that, so long as you are being led by the Spirit and you are praying according to the Word of God. That's what it would mean to pray in the Spirit. Amen? All right. Now, uh, Esther followed up her question, her earlier question about the blessings, spiritual blessings. And she says, are these blessings for both believers and unbelievers? I think good health is a spiritual blessing too. Now, okay, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. Now, and that's a good distinction actually. Spiritual blessings, spiritual things can only be comprehended by spiritual people. So spiritual blessings really can only be enjoyed by believers. Uh, other blessings can be enjoyed by non-believers, right? God makes the sunshine on the just and the wicked. God makes the rain fall where the just and the wicked live, right? So therefore, there are what you would call general blessings. General blessings, right? General blessings, they don't necessarily always have to be physical. So for instance, let me give you as an example of a general blessing that is not uh, spiritual, so to say, but it is not physical either. Intellect, right? Intellect. You find some people who are extremely, extremely smart. They are geniuses. They are prodigies. They are engineers. They they are able to conceive things that other people are not able to conceive with their minds. It's not physical, right? It's not something you can touch, but it's not spiritual either. In other words, it's not spiritual knowledge. They don't know God, they don't know about the things of God, but they know mathematics. They know, you know, science. They know biology. They know chemistry. And they know it in an extraordinary way. They know music, you know, Mozart and Bach and, and that kind of thing. So that's not a physical thing, but it's not, it's not also 
a spiritual thing. And that's something that you will find across the board. You'll find it amongst the Hindus, amongst the, the Muslims, Christians, atheists, it doesn't matter, right? So um, so it's, it's not easy to call those things um, physical, but you might call them natural, although they are extraordinary in that sense. Okay? Um, so yes, good health can be spiritual, but it also can be just uh, general because good health is given to all people, whether they, they believe in God or they don't. All right. Uh, next question. Uh, well, Gladys, allow me to skip yours just for a second uh, because Elias has asked a follow-up question on his. Then we'll, when Once we take yours, then we'll be able to move on. Elias says, so, so to pray in spirit is not necessarily to pray in tongues. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. In fact, you can say it this way, Elias. Praying in tongues is a way of praying in the spirit. So there are many ways of praying in the spirit. Praying in tongues is one of them. Okay? So praying, praying in tongues is a one of the ways of praying in the spirit, but praying in the spirit is not limited to praying in tongues. So there are people in the church, throughout the history of the church, let alone in the church, throughout the Bible, who prayed in the spirit, but they never prayed in a single tongue, foreign tongue for that matter. Of course, you have to pray in a tongue, right? Jesus never prayed in tongues all his life. Have you ever thought about that? Jesus never spoke in tongues, foreign tongues, as far as we know. Well, I mean, that we can, we can kind of come to the place where you say, okay, Jesus knew Greek. Jesus was not a Greek person. So, he might, and he might have spoken in Greek, he might, but he did not speak in a tongue that he did not understand. John, Mary, Elizabeth, all these people prayed, right? Daniel, but they were not praying in foreign tongues or unknown tongues, but they were praying in the spirit for sure. Does it make sense? Okay. Now, uh, well, I'm glad that you understand that. Now let's take the next one, Gladys. Gladys, you say, Churches always say forgiveness is a choice. I believe it's a spiritual blessing and God must be involved for us to have full forgiveness. My answer to that is yes and yes to both, to both parts. When, when people say forgiveness is a choice, it is a choice. Right, But just because it is a choice does not exclude God from the choice. In the same way, following God, seeking God, is a choice. Right? There are people who choose to follow God. There are people who choose to seek after God. And then there are people who choose not to. But those are people who choose to seek after God or to pray or to come to a Bible study like this one. You made a choice. But I can assure you that God is integral to your choices, all your choices, but especially spiritual choices. Right? Jesus told his disciples in John 15, you did not choose me. I chose you. Now, he was not saying you guys did not choose to follow me. He's not saying you guys were forced or were coerced, or were money. No, you made the choice, but your choice was uh, was consequential. It was a consequence of choices that were higher than yours. So in the same way, forgiveness. If forgiveness was not a choice, then we would not be instructed to do so. Let me, let me show you two places, right? Uh, first of all, Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. Look at the way that, so it's both and, it's not either or. It is both a choice and it is also a leading of the spirit. So it's, it's both work together. So then he says, um, 
here in um, Colossians, Colossians, Colossians. Here it is, verse 13. Let's begin at verse 12. Put on, then, which is interesting, it comes from the previous discussion. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility. You see, you're making a choice. He says, put this on. You don't have to. And I'm sure you've met Christians Maybe in the mirror. Maybe you've met Christians in the mirror. Because these things, sometimes I meet them in the mirror when I'm not doing them. In other words, there are times that I choose to be compassionate. And then there are times I choose not to be. There are times I choose to be kind. There are times I make the choice not to. To be humble. Sometimes I'm proud. I'm sure that you guys know that guy in the mirror. That woman in the mirror. Meekness, patience bearing with one another and if one has a complaint against another forgiving one another as the lord has forgiven you so you also must forgive so is 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 not assuming that this is just going to happen automatically you have to make a conscious choice and sometimes it's going to be harder than at other times we spoke about the other day you know, uh, somebody asked, I think it was Dr. Janet, why is it so hard to forgive? And I said it is harder to forgive sometimes than at others. It's harder to forgive some things than others, right? When somebody has done something very, very grievous to you, it's harder to forgive than if it is just a minor offense. Right? So, and, and those are choices that have to be made. And of course, the Lord is there to help us, but he doesn't force us. It doesn't force us. So just because I have the spirit does not mean I will forgive. Because I know sometimes, and it's important to understand this, because sometimes you'll see somebody, they they just, I can't forgive them. I can't forgive them. And then you say to them, then how can you have the Holy Spirit? How can you even be a Christian if you can't forgive? Right? Just because I have the spirit doesn't mean that I'm perfect. and doesn't mean that I do everything as I ought to. So because there's a there's a growth curve in in the in the walk of faith. Amen. Praise God. So um, hopefully that explains that. And of course, Gladys, uh, we might have to bring up that song by Michael Jackson. I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to make a change. <laughs> right? So, uh, next question, please. Next question. Uh, any topic is uh, good to go. You can ask any question in any topic. It can be in the character of God, angels, devils, Sin, the church, the past, the present, the future, revelation, end times, or not, second coming. So please feel free. Feel free. Now, our brother Grady, he says, okay, I told my wife, God is more important than you. I told her, I'm the head of this house, and date night will have to wait. So I have made my bed. I have my bed made on the couch and, and, and ready to listen. <laughs> right. I think that has to do with that spiritual blessing called wisdom, right? <laughs> right. It is true. It is true that uh, God is the most important uh, person and being in our lives, right? But at the same time, he expects us to be wise in how we communicate that information to our loved ones because if we communicate it in such a way in which they feel 
they are useless. <laughs> and I know you're kidding. I know you're joking, Grady. But uh, indeed, God is most important. Amen. Very well. So is there a topic that uh, you guys would like for me to delve into tonight, to look into tonight, uh, that maybe I did not uh, spend as much time as I needed to in the last time? And today, uh, can you turn on that thing? She has just turned off my screen. Come and put on my blue light. Whoa. So now you see how my background looks like without the light, guys. We need the light. Thank you. Done. Okay, so... Um, that's how the green screen works. So obviously the home behind me is not mine. It is a make-believe home. It is mine by faith. Sam Karaoke, I see you. I welcome you. Um, Rodney D. Moyes, always a joy to have you. Paul K.N., gospel musician. Ruth Wairimo, Karibu, welcome Esther Waiganjo, Alice Jebichime. Uh, thank you so much, guys. So, um, questions, questions, questions. This is Ask the Pastor Bible Study, and today I did not come with any particular uh, you know, topic or agenda, so I'm depending on your questions in order to uh, get the show moving. And, I, and please excuse me if you see me uh, doing some nasty cold stuff because I still have kind of a cold, runny nose every now and then. And uh, we will deal with that as we go. And I know the Lord is working. So Gladys, Gladys uh, says, does a person christened as a baby, does a person christened as a baby need to be baptized? Now, at first, it may seem as if that is a simple question. But in other words, now the question itself is simple, but the issues within that question are quite complex. Because what is christening? What is christening? And what is baptism? Right? Now, let me define both things. Now, christening has two dimensions to it. There is the cultural dimension to it, and then there's the spiritual dimension to it. The cultural dimension of christening, christening is simply giving somebody what is considered to be a Christian name. Culturally. The Western culture, the European culture, within the last, uh, let me just call it, within the last a thousand years, even more. Whenever, for instance, the, the missionaries, the white people, the Caucasians came to Africa and they brought the gospel to us, one of the things they insisted on is that if you become a Christian, you must be Christened. And therefore, we begin to receive excuse me, Christian names. So I'm called Stephen. Right? And so on and so forth. And James and Peter and Esther. So these are Christian names. These are names that are derived from the New Testament and also from the Old Testament. So that's cultural. In actual fact, in actual fact, the cultural part of christening is just that. It's just cultural. It has no spiritual value. Me being called Stephen does not make me more of a Christian. There are many murderers called Stephen. There are many rapists called Stephen, there are many corrupt, wicked men called Stephen. So being called Stephen, being christening somebody, has no spiritual value. Right? It has a cultural value. 
So when when somebody, it's easier, Stephen is a much easier name to remember than Munyori, which is my name too, in the Western context. In my African context, Munyori is probably more, you know, more, you know, easier to, to, to relate with. So christening is a cultural thing. But if christening was being done in the, in a, in a more spiritual way, it would mean that if you're being christened, being christened is being given the same name as Christ. That's what the, the actual foundational meaning of christening is, is Christianizing somebody. So christening is being named so that you can say the people who are named by my name, God will say. Right? Second Chronicles 7, 14. Those who are called by my name. So the name of God is Christ, right? So those who are Christian have his name. So that's a spiritual meaning. So now, therefore, now when you when you think about that, when you Christian a baby, it means you give them a Christian name. It has no spiritual value in and of itself. In and of itself, it does not make that child more of a Christian than they were before. It just makes them culturally a Christian. So they are not Ahmed. All right? So now you know this John and Muhammad. Immediately you meet these little boys in the elementary school. You know one is a Christian. The other one is a Muslim. But really John and Ahmed have no idea what Christianity or Islam are. Okay, so that's cultural. So therefore... You christen a little baby if you are in that tradition, if you are in the Roman Catholic tradition, if you are in the Anglican tradition, the Church of England, if you are in the Lutheran tradition, Methodist tradition, you christen this little baby. But all that you have done is that culturally you have identified them with people who practice the Christian religion. But that doesn't mean they are Christian. So when this child comes to the age of knowledge, the age of... Uh, knowing things and they come to the place where they understand what righteousness is what sin is what uh death is and so on and so forth and what christ died on the cross then they believe in christ according to the bible that's when they ought to be baptized so christening is not in the bible so there's no instruction anywhere you need to christen people at this age or in these circumstances. No. That is just something that people picked up from some of the things that Jesus did, although Jesus did not say, be doing this. Right? You know, Jesus uh, gives certain names to, to certain disciples, Peter and all that. Right? But he didn't say that's what we ought to be done every time. This is just something that people picked up. So, therefore, baptism according to uh, the scriptures ought to be done uh, because somebody has believed. Because baptism, now let's come to the definition of baptism. Baptism, uh, on a natural level, baptism just means to immerse in a liquid, in a fluid, in some medium. So when you put your dishes underwater to rinse them, that is baptizo in Greek. You are immersing them. So baptism means to put under, to put into, so baptism in a spiritual sense means to enjoin a person to a particular spiritual body. So the children of Israel were baptized into Moses. They were made into the congregation of Moses. They were in Moses. They followed Moses. They lived under Moses. That's what it means to be baptized into Moses. The New Testament believers are baptized into Christ. So baptism ultimately is taking an individual and making them part of a corporate body. So therefore, if you're going to become the, a part of the body of Christ, it means that you would have to have believed in the precepts and the concepts and the principles of Christ. You have decided to follow Jesus. So you are baptized into Christ. You become a part of the body of Christ. That is something that can only be done to a person who knows what they are doing. Now, does it mean that those who are 
baptize when they are little children that that is sinful. No, it is not sinful, but it is it has no spiritual value. Okay, unless that child when they grow up, they come to that place where they they have an encounter and a revelation, if you will, uh, an understanding of who Christ is, and they choose to believe in him. Now, if they choose not to be baptized again, that's fine, because they are. What, what really brings you into the body of Christ is believing. Baptism you do for people on the outside, the other believers, so that they can know, hey, I identify with you, you identify with me, and so on and so forth. Amen? So Gladys, hopefully that answers that question. So christening is a tradition and baptism also can be a tradition depending on which part of the body of Christ you're part of. So if you're an evangelical uh, under mostly the reformed or Pentecostal tradition, you'll find that we do not baptize people until they have become at least somewhat uh, mature adults or at least teenagers who can make their own decision whether they truly want to follow Christ. But if you are, if you come from a Lutheran, Methodist, Anglican, Catholic, Roman Catholic tradition, you'll find that those things can be done when a person is a child. And so that argument can be made by both groups of people. So I'm not going to try and do that. Now, uh, Grady, Grady says circumcision. Circumcision. Let's talk about circumcision. I know it's important, he says. I also know it wasn't evident. So how in the world did every no, brought everyone know, everybody know, who was and who wasn't circumcised? Not trying to be crass, but how was it known by others? Well, you may be surprised at how evident it was. <laughs> okay? Number one, uh, in public baths, and in the Greek culture, there was public bathing all the time. So they would, you'd find a place where men would go into the same public bath. Okay, And in that place, um, I, I can tell you this. When I went to boarding school in Kenya, we had a shared bathroom. And in, even maybe many of you men, even you, Grady, you were, if you went to high school and you played football or basketball, after the game, you all went to the same ba bathroom. And generally, it was just open showers. Right? And so you would know. So even back then, it was like that. Okay? Uh, so then also, there is evidence that the Olympics... The first Olympics that were held back then in the days of the first century and before, the runners used to run naked. The runners used to run naked. That was common. And so that's why the Apostle Paul says that if you are circumcised, do not seek to be uncircumcised. Because there would be operations People who wanted to dissociate themselves with circumcision, there would be operations to attach a foreskin. Could you, excuse me, just one second, guys. So, just one second. Excuse me, guys, I just had to uh, 
update some of my customers on uh, a load that we are carrying for them. So I apologize for taking off for a minute. So anyway, so circumcision was quite evident, Brother Grady, in the first century, in those centuries. Now, if you were a Jewish man, number one, you had to be circumcised on the eighth day. This was a given. If you were not circumcised, you could not be a part of the people of Israel. Again, that could be easily identified. And the people of Israel were not trying to joke around with that. So nobody was trying to hide around and not be circumcised. But the Gentiles, on the other hand, were very, very, very adamant on not being circumcised. So therefore, there was no question about it. And so that's why you see that like when uh, uh, Paul comes with, I believe it's Titus, and don't quote me on this one, uh, and he has to have him circumcised to bring him into the city of Jerusalem. Otherwise, this would be chaos. So it was quite evident. Uh, sometimes it was just a matter of uh, features. You look at a man, he is, let's say, a uh, black man like I am. I know I'm not black in color, but, you know, kind of thing. Or somebody's Caucasian. They are not, uh, they are, they are not in the same kind of racial features as a Jew. You knew they were Greek, you knew they were Roman, you knew they were North African. You'd be like, are you circumcised? So that conversation could be easily had back then. And that conversation can be had even, you see, Grady, I come from a culture in which, for instance, in my country, where I come from, we have 42 different uh, tribes, cultures. Some of them circumcise, some of them don't. And it's evident. It's quite evident. You don't have to show the organ to know if somebody is circumcised. Just being part of a particular community, you know, those people don't circumcise, those people circumcise. Just, just generally. But then, of course, uh, from childhood, boyhood, uh, manhood, there are many opportunities for that to be verified. <laughs> right? If you get married to a woman from my particular ethnic group, and you are not circumcised, there will be trouble, my friend. They will out you. They will run out screaming and say, ah, they're not cut. So it's, 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 it, there are many ways in which this was made evident. Okay. Now, of course, since we are discussing uh, the Bible, once the gospel began to go beyond the Jews, circumcision did not get uh, abrogated, removed. It, it got transformed, right? So circumcision now moved from being a physical thing to being a spiritual thing. Because circumcision from, the early, from early on was just a sign of uh, identification and that something has been cut off from you. So circumcision now was given its proper meaning when Christ came, and it is the cutting off of the sinful nature, and so on and so forth. Uh, give me just one second, guys. Let me send this short email. Okay. Give me just one second. I have to, I do have to send this location. Share that. Put full bold. Yep. Okay. And then we will continue in a moment. Here, paste. Okay, correct. All right, sorry about that. So, here we go. Uh, 
so hopefully brother grady will follow up with with uh with that so he says this i think we should follow up his, his his comments here first of all he says i've tried to find it in history but both josephus and tacitus are silent on the subject many people especially antiochus epiphanes were killed because they were circumcised uh, if a circumcised man entered the city, they were killed. Was there an exam? I know this seems odd or crass, but that isn't my intention. I just don't know how it was an evident distinction. Again, just look at it. I just look at just search a little bit more for evidence. It was there. The public baths were very, very uh, common in the Greek culture. The public bath was a very common thing in the Greek culture. Okay, the Jews de demanded it. So, in other words, their whole their whole culture demanded it. Their women demanded it. Their men demanded it. You could not marry one until you showed evidence that you are circumcised. Remember the whole issue of uh, Dinah, the daughter of uh, Jacob, right? Where Levi was it? Levi and uh, Levi and Levi and Simeon. I think they're the ones who killed the guy who had raped their sister and then married her by forcing them to get circumcised first. So hopefully that helps. Now let's let's move on to the next question here. Um, the next question is or topic is by Rodney. Rodney Moyes says, you can speak on people claiming end times 70 AD is a doctrine. End times 70 AD is a doctrine. So you can speak on the difference. I think you might have to clarify what you mean by that because 70 AD is a doctrine it is a doctrine in other words what is a doctrine a doctrine is a particular teaching a doctrine is a particular teaching for instance second coming is a doctrine right uh, uh, the pre-tribulation teaching is a doctrine so preterism is a doctrine. It's, so a doctrine is a particular set of instructions based on a particular set of foundational beliefs. So is 70 AD, is believing that Jesus Christ came back in 70 AD a doctrine? Yes, it is a doctrine that is distinguished, for instance, from futurism. Futurism says Jesus will return in the future. Preterism, which holds to the 70 AD doctrine or teaching, because our doctrine simply means teaching. And for one to believe that Jesus came back in 70 AD, you do have to be taught that doctrine by somebody. Uh, all my... never knew about it. I never even had a even a uh, suspicion that Jesus might have returned in 70 AD up until 2019. So therefore, that already tells you that is a teaching. That is a particular teaching that one has to, uh, you know, be taught or research until they come to either believe it or to say, that's hogwash. I don't believe in that. So that's how we distinguish that. The 70 AD doctrine, I would distinguish it from the futuristic doctrine or the partial pa preterism doctrine that says, yes, uh, there was a coming of Christ in 70 AD. Matthew 24 was fulfilled in 70 AD. March of Revelation was fulfilled in 70 AD. But there is a future second coming of Jesus in the future. So, yeah. Uh, so, uh, Brother Rodney follows up his question by saying, but it is written in the scriptures. <laughs> I agree, in a sense, in a way. But Rodney, think about it this way. Let's be let's be fair. If you picked up a Bible, if you picked up a Bible and you've never been a Christian, let's say you take a Bible to a Muslim today or to an atheist who has never, ever, ever interacted with Christianity and you give them the Bible, let's say you even give them just Matthew 24, right? Uh, will they read? And once they read, before doing any further research and getting outside information, would they come up and say, ah, this is all 70 AD? 
you would not come up with that. So in other words, even the 70 AD teaching, you do need to do further uh, study and further uh, substantiation to prove that it is 70 AD. And, that, and that's what you, we find ourselves mostly doing is you're studying and saying, oh my goodness, I didn't see that. I didn't see that, right? So therefore, that's why it is a teaching because you do a teaching is like mathematics, is like English literature, grammar, history. You have to put things together in order to bring a, a body of knowledge that forms that teaching. And so, therefore, uh, now, if one has a limited, like for instance, people who are not interested in Christianity like the Jews, they read the New Testament, but they don't come to the same conclusion, even though they are, they are not necessarily for one way or the other. Right? So, therefore, uh, that's why it becomes a teaching. Because you do have to uh, take certain things and and give them meaning and bring other things in and bring in Josephus and bring in Tacitus and bring in all these people. So it then it becomes a teaching. It becomes a doctrine that one chooses to believe or not to believe. And that's why there are many good, uh, there are many good Christians. For instance, I, I, I look at people like Dr. Bruce Gore, um, people like, um, well, let's just take Dr. Bruce Gore just for, for instance, or Dr. Kenneth Gentry, right? These are partial preterists. These are the people who actually have been very instrumental in teaching us that Matthew 24 did actually get fulfilled. Most of relation did get fulfilled. But then they get to a point, they say, but this one has not yet been fulfilled, right? So for so therefore, for me to believe that all of Revelation has, to be, has been fulfilled is not a... a, a you know, it's not a ball, it's, it's not a hit out of the park. It's not something that you can just look and say, well, it's obvious. Now, it's obvious to me because I have come to gather all this information and I've put it together and there is a great element of faith. With anything that concerns the Bible, there is always a great element of faith. There is always a great element of faith. Because why do I believe even believing in miracles. So miracles are a doctrine because, again, it's not something that is obvious to everybody. It's obvious what the author is saying, but do I believe it? And why do I believe it? What are the reasons? What, what are the principles by which I come to believe that? That's what makes it a doctrine. So that's why you hear people talking about uh, the 70 AD doctrine, the pre-tribulation doctrine, the post-tribulation doctrine, the uh, post-millennialist doctrine, the amillennialist doctrine. So all these are doctrines. They are teachings. And we have to be fair and say, yep, even the 70 AD teaching is a teaching. Okay. Now, uh, Brother Great says, Brother, I must disagree. I was raised a futurist, but after reading Josephus, I saw preterism before I ever knew there was such a thing as preterist. Okay. But you see, you is after reading, that's why, and that's what I said. That, I think that's where we agree. That you do have to be introduced to other things that are not necessarily arranged in the Bible for you to begin to even come to that understanding. Okay. So, in, so again, Grady, since you grew up as a futurist, you grew up with the Bible, it was not until you read something that was extra biblical that you said, wait a minute. This is what this was talking about. But generally, most people are not even aware that Josephus exists. Now, if you are, if you are to put all that together and say, if you are given all the information that you have now, would you come to the conclusion that full preterism is the way? Personally, I would say 90%. But there, will still be, there, there are still 10% of things that even I still am like, ah, that verse, I'm not quite sure. That, that seems to contradict a little bit or at least seems to kind of go against what I'm believing. So there, are, there is a mystery in the whole thing. There's a mystery in the whole thing. And at the end of the day, 
I believe that it's a question of faith. I believe it's a question of faith. I believe that the Holy Spirit has to lead you there and guide you there and help you by opening uh, that part of your spiritual sight. Because think about, because you, uh, Grady and Rodney, and I have been in places where you have a futurist arguing ab- against every, every evidence of preterism, right? And they are pretty, they're not a stupid person, they're not an idiot. They are somebody who is a good scholar, but they just don't see it. And whatever you see, they say, no, no, that's not what that means. And that's not what that indicates. So when I say that, I have to say, well, it's not just about academics. It's not just about even factual, uh, technical, literal evidence. There is an aspect of faith that cannot be removed from the place of believing. Right? So, therefore, uh, when you come to believe in something so powerfully, for instance, for you to believe that Jesus did come in 70 AD, it takes faith. Even if you are given all the evidence, The same way for you to believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead. It takes faith because you are taking somebody else's word for it. Because you are not there. You didn't see it. You didn't see Jesus walking on the earth. Right? There were people that lived then. There were people that saw Jesus. But yet they doubted that it was him. Right? The Bible says that, right? When when it says, let me show you this. This this when I was shown this for the first time, because I'd already always read it and skimmed over it and never seen it. This blew my mind. Let me show you this. This 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 uh there was a preacher friend of mine, not that I know him personally, but he's a friend of mine because I, I just love the way he preaches. But anyway, one day he preached about uh having doubts. He said, You may you may have doubts. Some of you have doubts about your faith. Right, And he says, don't beat yourself up too much if you have doubts about these things. Because he says, look at this. Um, Verse 16, Matthew 28. Now, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. The 11. So here we are not talking about Judas. We are talking about the other guys. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. (laughs) But some doubted. What are you you talking about? Which which some? Some some of the 500 people that saw Jesus? No. Some of the 11. So amongst the 11 that had seen Jesus a number of times, after he rose up from the dead, <laughs> some doubted. I have a suspicion that Thomas, even having put his finger in the hole, even having touched Jesus, I believe that he was still. I was like, I, I don't know. I mean, this, this could be, this could be a hallucination. This can just be true. <laughs> so, so if people who are there, who saw him, doubted. How much more those who never saw it, who are living 2,000 years later. Amen. By the way, thank you for that good joke, Brother Grady. (laughs) You're just like me. You and I, you know, we figured it out. (laughs) So, anywho, uh, that, so that's why, uh, Brother Rodney, that's why it's called a doctrine, because it's a teaching based on certain people who have. So, in other words, if it was so obviously clear, preterism would be the, the main teaching of Christianity. 
but it is not just that clear. I wish it was. It is once you see it, but before you see it, it is, for me, I had never even considered it. So the, the challenges that I had with futurism were not whether futurism is true. It was whether it was pre-tribulational, post-tribulational, amillennialist, that was my challenge. I didn't even know that the great tribulation had to have taken, I'd read Matthew 24 hundreds of times, at least a million times, but I never saw it. I never saw it. <laughs> Amen. So anyway, uh, so but these are good questions and these are good uh, observations. And I know that uh, as we wrestle with them, hopefully we get to become clearer and clearer uh, over time. And I'm glad, brother, greatly that you are getting encouraged by this fellowship. It's always a joy. Okay, so can we go to uh, the next uh, question? Is there another question? This is Ask the Pastor Bible Study. If you have a question, let me check, because sometimes people ask me questions on the, uh, what you call it? Um... Let me see if there's anybody who has a question on the messenger. And I don't see any uh, questions yet. All right, so... And guys, remember that uh, there's no pressure to ask questions, so you don't need to feel pressure to ask them. If you have them, you have them. If you don't, the broadcast comes to its natural end. Because different days are for different uh, purposes. Amen. Amen, amen. Now, Gladys asks, if the tribulation was three and a half years, what happened to the other three and a half years? Okay, now, Gladys, let's uh, first of all set a baseline. Why did you say that the tribulation was three and a half years? And why... Uh, where did you get the other three and a half years? Because um, from your question, it, it seems that you have seven years, right? And the seven years are split into two, three and a half, three and a half. So now I kind of have an idea where you're coming from, but I also want us to be, to, to I want to make sure that we are coming from the same place. Now, if you have been raised in, dispensationalism and futurism uh, already the teaching is there is a tribulation that is seven years long the church is taken away for seven years and then it comes back at the second coming and the great tribulation begins at the halfway mark so the tribulation begins at the three and a, at, at the at the beginning then after three and a half years the great tribulation comes so question is where are you coming from are you coming from a dispensational foundation or what what where, where are you where are you coming from in that 
right? Because, and this is what we mean, the war before 70 AD from 66 to 69 and a half years. Now, the war began in 66 AD, okay? And it ran all the way to 70 AD. So it was 42 months. It was three and a half years, right? Uh, and when we come to the issue of three and a half years, only the tribulation or only what we would call the great tribulation is given that uh, designation. Okay. Now let's let's look at the places where the three and a half years are given, and then we can work our way back, because I think that uh, there are many issues that kind of have been mixed up in this Daniel's seventy weeks. I think people mix it up with the tribulation. I don't think that they are mixed up. You know, I don't believe that they are connected in that way, but. Uh, let's let's uh, let's do this. Let's look at the three and a half years. Now, uh, first of all, when Jesus talked about the great tribulation, he did not give a length. So there is no length whatsoever associated with the length of the tribulation according to Jesus. Okay. Now, the two people who kind of give. Uh, that direction are Daniel and John, in the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. So let's go to the most, the clearest one, Revelation. So the first time that Revelation talks about the three and a half years or the 42 months is in Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. So he says, then I was given a measuring rod like a staff and i was told rise and measure the temple of god and the altar and those who worship there but do not measure the court outside the temple leave that out for it is given over to the nations and they will trample the holy city for 42 months so there are your three and a half years and I will grant authority to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1,260 days. So again, that's three and a half years. So it's the same time period. Okay. Uh, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying and they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. Now, because you had asked this question uh, at another time, Gladys, and I didn't have an opportunity to answer it. The two witnesses are the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets. So the Old Testament, rather. So really, the Old Testament, which was to be destroyed at the end of the war. The temple. The true word of God. But uh, secondarily, it's also the apostles. The apostles were the ones who are the true stewards, the true stewards of the Old Testament. They were the witnesses of God. They were the ones who were bringing clarity to Moses and the prophets. That's what the apostles came to do. So anyway, uh, and of course, uh, all this is kind of symbolic and also in real in a sense because they were killed, but not in the sense in in the in in the way that it is presented here, but it's presenting about their symbolic killing. But it is you first of all have to understand that two witnesses are the law and the prophets. So the war against the law and the prophets, the Bible, really began in 66 AD. 
and ended in 73 and a half years. So, and that's why you see that for three and a half days, this is a kind of a prophetic statement that is speaking about the same time period. So the three and a half days here is equal to the 42 months, in my view, is equal to the 1260 days. So really, John identifies the time when the Gentiles are trampling the city of Jerusalem to be three and a half years, which is the same time from when they surrounded Jerusalem in 66 AD and as long as the, as the war lasted. So that's what is called the time of the tribulation or the great tribulation. Uh, when you go back over here to Jesus, and if I go too fast, please tell me, if you go back to Jesus in Matthew 24, Uh, Jesus tells you when the tribulation happens, right? The tribulation. So there is a general tribulation that was happening from time immemorial. There was the great tribulation which begins at verse 15. It says, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, which is of course a part of the Jerusalem temple, let the reader understand. Let the, those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in, uh, who, who let he who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in the house. Let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. Alas, for women who are pregnant and those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation. So the great tribulation begins with the abomination that causes desolation. Hopefully that makes sense. So therefore, we know that the abomination that causes desolation, we are told in Luke 21, happens when Jerusalem is surrounded by the armies. And that took place in 66 AD. So that's when the great tribulation begins. So therefore, the other so-called three and a half years are kind of contrived. They, 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 you'd have to have come from a dispensational futuristic uh, scheme to have seven years. Okay. So, uh, let me see. So, uh, so Gladys, so therefore, really, even if you go back to Daniel, you find that Daniel also, also has three and a half years. You really don't find anybody with seven years. Let me tell you where the seven years came from. Because, of course, I also uh, came up from a dispensation of futuristic point of view. In the mind of the futurists, the prophecy of Daniel in Daniel 9, from verse 24 going forward, there are 70 weeks. Okay? And according to futuristic thinking, uh, God fulfills the first 69 weeks of years all the way up to the crucifixion of Jesus. So therefore, when Jesus dies, according to this scheme of thinking, uh, one week is left. So therefore, the prophecy of the 70 weeks given to Daniel was fulfilled all the way up to the 69th week. And then, God hit the pause button. And the 70th week was pushed into some time in the future, which is still future to us. So the 70th week of Daniel, according to futurism, is yet to take place. So that's where people get seven years. So that now, once they have the seven years of the 70 weeks, because that's one week, because the 69 is gone, only one week is left, one week is seven days. Seven days, one day is equal to a year. So you have seven years. So now, but because uh, both Revelation and Daniel only speak about three and a half, therefore, we have this division of when now Jesus is ready to return, there will be seven years left at the end. So you, you have to divide it into seven years, uh, three and a half years of peace, three and a half years of great tribulation. So that's how futurism 
divides it up. Of course, the problem is this. I never thought about it this way, but now I can see that that's what the Bible teaches. At no point does any numbered prophecy ever stop. So in other words, if God says this is going to take uh, 70 years, for instance, from, from the slavery of Israel was going to be 70 years. God never gets to the 69th year and tells the children of Israel, I'm pause. I'm going to come back to fulfill the 70th year of your slavery or of your redemption. Sometime in the future, I don't know when, or you don't know when. No, when he gives 70 years, it is exactly 70 years and time is fulfilled. Right? So in the same way, the 70 weeks of Daniel were fulfilled not only within the lifetime of Jesus, but shortly after the lifetime of Jesus, the time never stopped. Daniel 9 at no point gives us any idea that time stops and that there is a gap between the 69th and the 70th week. No, the 69 weeks, the 70 weeks run concurrently and they come to their end. And therefore, we must understand that the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled during the first three and a half years of the apostles' lives after the, the outpouring of the Spirit. The 70 weeks were fulfilled during the lifetime of Jesus and his disciples. Those seven years were fulfilled. So 70 weeks of Daniel are done. Seven, even 70 AD is not part of the 70 weeks. That's how I've come to uh, see it and understand it. So there is no such thing as a seven-year tribulation in the Bible. It's only three and a half years. Both by Daniel. So I've shown you the one in, in, in Revelation. Let me show you the one in Daniel because somebody might you keeps talking about the one in Daniel. So in Daniel, let me show you the three and a half years of Daniel. Here they are. Daniel 12. Daniel 12, verse number 7. Now, Daniel is talking about the great tribulation. He says, at that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who was charge over your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, tribulation, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. That is the book of life. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Now it's interesting that Jesus unsealed the book in Matthew 24, which confirms that the time of the end was Matthew 24. Not our time. The book of Daniel was unsealed 2,000 years ago by Jesus. So many shall run to and fro and knowledge, that is the knowledge of the Lord, not the knowledge of computers, not the knowledge of Apple computers and Android. The knowledge of the Lord shall increase. Then I, Daniel, looked and behold, two others stood, one on this bank of the stream, one on the other bank of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders? Now, notice what this man, whom I believe could possibly be Jesus, says. Verse 7, And I had the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, so a time is one. Times are two and half a time. Three and a half times. And so both Daniel and John in Revelation agree that from the time of the great tribulation till the end is three and a half times. Three and a half years. 1,260 days. 
42 months. So seven years, you don't find them anywhere. You don't find them anywhere in the Bible, at least in relation to the end times. And when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would have been finished. From the time that the great tribulation began in 66 AD to the time that the temple, the power of the holy people was completely and utterly destroyed, it took exactly 42 months. Three and a half years, 1260 days. And something else Daniel says concerning the same thing. He says, uh, and from the time that the regular bond offering is taken away and the abomination, the desolation is set up, there shall be 1290 days. Why is there a difference? Why 1290? Whereas in Revelation is 1260? Is depending on how you count. Because uh, the Jewish calendar had 30 days to a month. Every month was 30 days. So that's why three and a half years ends up to be exactly 1260 days. If you take 42 months and you multiply it by 30, you'll get 1260. However, the Jews in their uh, lunar calendar, they recognize that once every four years, there is a leap year. So what they would do, they, they didn't add a day in February like we do in the Gregorian calendar. No. Once every four years or every so often, they would uh, have an extra month. So there would be a particular year that would have 13 months. In that year, you'd have 12 and 1290 days instead of 1260 because the difference between 1260 and 1290 is 30 days. So those, those are the 30 days of the leap year. Okay. So, blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1335. So he's starting from the Great Tribulation. He's saying, wait until 1290. Blessed is the one who arrives at 1335 because apparently 1335 is the point at which you get to enter. Okay, but go your way till the end and you shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. All right, uh, personal question by Grady. Personal question. Is it, is it? Where is it? Personal question. Are most African tribes an oral culture? If you can comment on the differences having witnessed both. Uh, it depends on what you mean by an oral culture. Okay. Now, are you talking about oral versus uh, literature, written? And southern, most, most tribes of Africa, south of the Sahara, most were, were an oral, at least in the modern times, in the last 2,000 years. Were oral. Most of the history was passed down in an oral manner. Stories. Okay. North of the Sahara, Egypt, and Tunisia, and North Africa, they were very. They they knew how to write. They wrote their history. They. So we have when you go to Egypt, when you go to some parts of Nubia, some parts of the Sudan, you find many pyramids in the Sudan. The pyramids are not only found in Egypt, they're also found in the Sudan. And they have uh, hieroglyphics, they have a system of writing in them. So, hopefully that answers that. And he says, uh, most African cultures are oral cultures and were, we are more a written culture. Well, I would say that would be true, Grady if you're talking about thousands of years ago. Because, think about this, Grady. I don't know what your, I don't know where your ancestors come from. In other words, if you go to the Celts, or the, the Scythians, or the Barbarians, right? Most European peoples were not an, a written culture. So, writings were more 
um, prevalent in the East more than in the West. So everybody who lived uh, East of Jerusalem and close around Jerusalem, so Egypt is West, but any, any, any cultures that seem to be around there, Egypt, uh, Israel, Mesopotamia, going to China, Korea, they were they wrote. West, they did not, right? Now, of course, if you go to, if you come to the Americas, right? South America, even thousands of years ago, you find a lot of writings. So it's kind of a toss-up there. So if you're talking about modern times, if you go to any African country today, everybody writes, everybody reads and writes. Within the last two, three hundred years, everybody reads and writes. So therefore, I would not say that there is a, there is any uh, big chunk of oral culture in Africa now. Everybody, even, even those who maintain their traditions, they still write about their story. So I can tell you about the Maasai. They write. <laughs> okay. You can read about the Maasai. You can read about the Zulus. Because they write. Because Christianity, one of the impacts of Christianity and the gospel moving across the world is that uh, it introduced the culture of reading because you have to read the word. But it's not just Christianity, to be fair. The spread of Islam also um, spread writing and reading because Islam, the Arabic culture was also a very literal culture, a very mathematical culture, right? Most, a lot of mathematics is, is uh, considered to, to have uh, been already in use, in great use in the Arabian culture. Right, the way we write today in in the West, we use Arabic uh, figures. Right, the, our alphabet is Arabic. The A, B, C, D, and all that is is mostly Arabic. So, um, now he says, uh, having seen both, can you expand how it affects your view of the Bible? Oh, personally, it doesn't, to, to be honest with you, because for one, like I said, uh, for where I come from in Kenya, reading and writing was introduced way back in 1844, which of course is not a very long time in terms of world history. So therefore, by the time my grandparents are adults, reading and writing had become uh, relatively common. My parents' generation, they all went to school, they went to college, went to university. My generation, everybody. So in other words, um, when I was seven years old or even younger, I went to nursery school. Well, I didn't go to nursery school, but most people went to nursery school, four years, five years old. So that's what you call kindergarten here. Or German, kindergarten is a German word, right? <laughs> Because that's what they call kids, right? Kinders. So anyway, uh, when I went to school, I learned my ABCDs. I learned how to speak English and to read English and to read Swahili and to do math from seven years old. And that's everyone. Well, not everyone, but the majority of people in most of the third world are actually more uh, more educated in terms of uh, academics than the majority of people in the Western world. So therefore, when you ask how does that affect your view of the Bible, generally, at least in our in our generation and, and forward, we, our view of the Bible is that we read the Bible. So I I don't know how my ancestors processed it because they would have been told stories it would have been read to them but i i doubt that it would affect uh grievously or at least uh because faith comes by hearing right faith does faith does not come by reading reading can be a method of hearing but there's there no necessity for one to read 
in order to have faith. So my grandmother could not read, but she could hear. So the Bible was read to her, she believed. And, and so it was in that generation, or in those earlier generations. Okay, moving on along. Uh, Grady, somebody was looking for you. Rodney says, where is he? We have a lot in common. Um, more asking about the differences in worldviews the two have. Having been immersed in both, I would love to hear the pros and cons of both. Probably another lesson, but I'm curious. So again, and I think I've, I've already, I think I made it clear, most people in my generation and the generation that have come up, up, up after us, we have no idea what it means to live in an oral culture. Per se. Now, my grandfather told me stories, right? But I believe that everybody's grandparents or even parents. So in other words, the same way, let's say a Western kid will have Cinderella read to them because they themselves cannot read. I had the same experience, except my, my grandfather was not reading a fairy tale book. He was telling the story. He remembered the story or he made up the story. I don't know which one it was. But, you know, every night my grandfather would tell me stories. Even my father would tell me stories. So I'm not sure that I I am I qualify to say that I know what it is to be part of uh, an exclusively oral culture. So the experiences of children in the third world today and in the last 30, 40 years are basically the same. The only th difference between the Western culture, the first world, America, some parts of Europe and Africa and some parts of Asia and maybe South America is simply the economic uh, standards of living. So in other words, the kid in Africa will go to school and learn A, B, C, D, one, two, three, and progress all the way to calculus, same kid, right? And the same way the kid in America will do. Only difference is the kid in Africa will go to school with no shoes on or will only have one set of uniform if he has one. Might eat one meal a day. But otherwise, once they get into class, we are learning the same material. We are being expected to solve the same mathematical problems. So it, it's, it's interesting. When you first come to America, for many people, uh, for instance, I would go to places and uh, I would meet people. And, you know, let's say I was on a job, whether you know it was in a retail store or wherever I worked. And... Uh, at first, we would not be able to understand each other because of accents and all that, right? But after some while, they could understand everything I was saying. And they would be like, wow. They would say, so, uh, you come from Africa, yeah. So, um, how long did it take you to learn English? And I'll be like, what do you mean? I mean, you've only been here how long? One year? Two years? But you speak so fluently. Because now this person is assuming that I started learning the English language when I landed in America. And of course, sometimes we would kind of, you know, take people for a ride and say, yeah, I mean, it took me nine months. And they would now be so mesmerized because they would think that you are super genius, right? But in reality, I learned English grammar from when I was seven years old as an academic exercise. I was tested in vocabulary. I was tested in uh, pronouns and adverbs and all this just the same way. That, but for us, because it is a second language, whenever you're learning a second language, you learn it better and more technically than the uh, natural speaker of it. Because the natural speaker of it does not find the burden of learning the language. Because they feel, they feel I know the language, I know how to speak English. Why do I need to, to, be, to learn English? But if your mother tongue is not English, then you learn it just the same way you learn math or any other language. So hopefully that helps. Okay. Uh, Grady says, thanks. I deleted the first question, then asked the, question, the second. That's why it was confusing. Sorry. You have spoken a lot about your grandpa telling stories and such. Yes, my grandpa did. But remember, my grandpa only did that when I went to visit him during the holidays. So I would spend most of my year in school. But when I went to visit him, 
then I would want him to tell me the stories about the monsters and the cyclops and the giants. And he would tell me those stories. Because to me, as a kid, uh, I could relate more to his stories because he, he put them in a local context and in our language, as opposed to me reading about uh, Jack and the Beanstalk. Because Jack, even when I read about Jack and the Beanstalk when I was eight years old or nine years old, Jack was a white boy. And the giants were also white. In the book, I could see it, right? So I knew Cinderella was a white girl. So I knew, I knew uh, inherently that the fairy tales that I read in the books in the library at school were about another culture. So I never, I, I, I never read Cinderella and imagined that it was happening in my culture. Because in my culture, when people went to the dance, <laughs> there was no glass slipper. <laughs> there were no shoes to, to, to begin with. So it was, a, it was an interesting story, but it was not, it was not going to, to translate. Was like, I mean, who, who puts on a glass slipper in Africa? So, so... Interestingly, so those kind of stories, you would actually be with them wondering, why, why does she have a glass slipper? <laughs> why, why does she need a glass slipper and so on and so forth? So, so you know, that kind of thing. You, you know, so there are stories that I used to wonder when I was a kid, what does that even mean? Why do Jack and Jill need to go up the hill to get water? For us, when we want to get water, we go down the hill. Because you know, the wells were downstream, or the river was downstream. That's where you went to get water. You didn't go to get water upstream. So to me, I was like, why is Jack why is Jack falling down and breaking his noggin? Anyway, let's get back to the Bible here. <laughs> so Gladys says, did, he, did they teach you the word, y'all? <laughs> Oh my goodness, no. Y'all, y'all I learned right here in the good old United States. Y'all is uh is not found anywhere else, but in the good old United States. Y'all are y'all hearing me? So those ones you learn because so those are things that you learn if you are living in a particular place and you need to communicate in a certain way. Now <laughs> right. <laughs> My wife is laughing at me. So I, I, I went to a, a school in Kenya that was a mission school. So in other words, it was set up by, or it was funded by American Baptist Mission. So half, or maybe let's say sometimes a third, or maybe less, or even quarter of our teachers always were American. So our principal was American, and my math teacher was American, and my history teacher. So we had American teachers. My English teacher, definitely, all the way up to 12th grade, was an American. But she was a professional. So she taught us uh, the right way to say things and the right way to do things. And you are not allowed to, to say ain't and can't and, and all that. Right? She was a white lady. So uh, we, you, in, in Africa, you don't learn Ebonics. Ebonics is something that you, you get on, on the street, right? Um, so, so in other words, uh, we were not allowed to say, I, I, I'm gonna, I wanna. She, she would say, no, that's not English. That's not technical English. So you don't, you, you, you say, I want to, I'm going to, and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, since she's still alive and, and, and she's my friend on Facebook. Sometimes I would cringe when I would say something else. Like, oh, she must listen to me and say, I, I, after all those years of teaching you proper English, and you're going to come and just pick up Ebonics. But of course, for the purposes of ministry, for me, it was for purposes of ministry. When I went in the inner city and I began to minister amongst African-Americans, 
I chose to adopt uh, a dialect that was close to what they could hear. So I listened and I heard what they, they spoke. And, you know, so that, that's just part of, you know, when you're amongst the Jews, you become like a Jew when you're amongst the uh, different people, you just become like them for the purposes of communication. <laughs> Grady says, I know this is a comedy show, but you do know Jesus was white with blonde hair. <laughs> I know. Ah, how did you relate? I'm sorry. After telling us about Cinderella, I couldn't just help myself. <laughs> right. Now, let me just address that. In most people's minds, in Africa at least, in Africa, not in America, in most people's minds, Jesus is lily white, blonde, blue-haired, or well, 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 blue-eyed, rather. Blonde-haired, blue-eyed. Now, you may ask, why? Why would Africans believe that? When we were kids, we all, one of the, one of the most effective evangelism tools that was used was the Jesus movie. You all know the Jesus movie, right? Like from way back in 1970 something. From the 70s, the Jesus movie. The original one. The uh, Franco Zeferali. It was directed, you know, now I know I'm going to, uh, I'm going to betray my age, right? Do you all remember the, the Jesus movie directed by Franco Zeferari? So obviously that guy was as white as you can get, right? And this was a movie that was shown throughout Africa for years. It was shown over and over. So many times, even if you didn't know how to read and they were saying they want to show you about Jesus, that's a movie you saw. And so you knew that's Jesus. <laughs> that's Jesus. Uh, and uh, and so, so that's, that's the, the image that stuck in the mind. And so I, I remember the first time that I had Billy Graham and I was already an adult, actually. I was already in America. I remember the first time that I had Billy Graham saying, you know, Jesus was not a white man. And I was like, what? Billy Graham, you, you don't understand that Jesus is a white man, right? Uh, and Billy Graham was preaching that message. You can find it on YouTube. He was saying, no, Jesus was not a white man. He was probably the same, had the same features as the people in the Middle East, which, of course, when you go to the people in the Middle East, the, the Syrians, the Arabs, all the people that was around Israel, modern-day Israel, they are not white people. They might have light skin in a, in some fashion, but in that environment, you're not going to remain very white, right? Unless you stay inside your house and never come out because your the sun is overhead almost 12 hours a day. So anyway, so that's the image. Now, so the the only people who really have a, a black Jesus kind of uh, approach are African-Americans. Because African-Americans... Uh, have been in the process of fighting for their identity, fighting for their liberation. And so uh, so because of where they come from, that's where... So you, you will not find people in Africa generally. There are people, of course, there are always people, but you will not find people in generally in Africa uh, conceiving of a black Jesus. As a matter of fact, many of them, if you tell them Jesus is not white, they'll be like, but I've believed in him. And now you're telling me it's not right. <laughs> okay. And then, of course, since Grady is in Mexico, the first time that I had somebody called Jesus, I couldn't believe it. How could they blaspheme the name of God and call it to, to, to a kid? You know? See, I already had always heard about Jesus, but I didn't know Jesus is Jesus. <laughs> So I guess the comedy show goes on. But, uh, you know, I, I remember uh, about two, well, actually it's more than three years now, we were renting a church somewhere down the street. And this church used to be generally in the past for many years, in its tradition, used to be more of a Caucasian church. And so, but eventually, it you know, dynamics changed and it became more, uh, well, actually it remained more of a Caucasian church, but they had a black pastor, an African-American. And, but at the back of the church was this huge 
picture of Jesus, the blonde Jesus, the blue-eyed Jesus. And uh, we we constantly joke with the pastor. We say he would tell me, you know what? If I was not an old man, I would I would get my ladder and climb up there and just remove that Jesus because that's not the Jesus of the Bible. But you know, so you guys get the idea. Is that um, many of the the point is that many of the images that we have about God, about Jesus, about angels. Have you ever? thought about an angel that is not white do you, when you think about angels do you what do you see in, in your mind angels are white then they all mostly they don't even have black hair they have blonde hair that's, I mean, it's, it's a given isn't it why because that's what's been presented in culture and so that gets ingrained in your mind and you just think that that's what it is right so that's uh just interesting uh, stuff. Uh, Rodney says, my pet peeve is, you know, you know, you know, Rodney, you know, <laughs> at the end of every sentence, you know, it's very English. It's a very bad English. This is, you know, <laughs> all right. Uh, so anyway, so sometimes we do talk about things that are not necessarily a verse in the Bible. Uh, Gladys, I was told to give you great disinformation. I will. Um, how shall I do that? Gladys, I, I suspect that in Australia, you guys use WhatsApp, right? And you can answer, you know, if you give me that answer, because I can give you greatest contacts on WhatsApp. You can put it on your messenger, uh, because I think he wants to commune with you. So... Uh, Grady says, oh my goodness, when we come to Mexico, we couldn't speak a word of Spanish, but we showed uh, that move in the villages and literally hundreds, that movie. So they showed the movies, the movie of Jesus, and literally hundreds came to faith in Christ. There is something about that movie. I have to say about, I have to say that there is something about that Jesus movie. I don't think that it has anything to do with, uh, with the color of the of the skin of the people acting it i just think that uh just like the passion of christ movie by um what's his name mel gibson i think that there there are people in this world that god gives a certain assignment and if they do it very well he blesses that work that jesus movie i believe was made from a point of purity they just wanted to communicate the life of Jesus. And so that movie has been very, very effective in communicating the gospel. Because you can preach for a whole week, but words, you know, there are people who believe, there are people who will come to understand what you're saying, but, you know, like they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. And definitely a moving picture tells the story so much better than a preacher probably can. So I, I agree with that. All right. So guys, uh, it seems like uh, that will probably be our show for today. It's two hours in. Uh, and so unless somebody else has something that they would like to uh, communicate as a last thought, I want to thank you. There it is. I want to thank you. When I when I first came to America, I, I could not say that. And now, let me say this, especially for my Kenyan uh, audience. When I hear Kenyans speak English, those who are native Kenyans and they live in Kenya, or they come to visit, I can't understand why they will say, I want to. Because now I'm so, so used to saying, I want to. Right? And you don't even hear yourself unless you're really thinking about it. So, uh, so those those are just uh, nuances that are interesting to think about and to uh, notice. So anyway, uh, thank you very much, Grady. Thank you, love you. Cam thank you for coming. Uh, if we get another opportunity, we'll get together tomorrow. Uh, if you have questions that you remember afterwards, because some people remember questions afterwards during the broadcast, you don't. You can always uh, you can always um, email me or text me or go to my messenger, 
you are free to do that. And uh, some questions I do answer right on that medium. Others, I'll bring them back to the broadcast and we will all be blessed. So thank you very much for coming to hang out with me uh, tonight. Have a very good night. God bless you. God keep you. And God continue to show you his ways in Jesus' name. Thank you. Love you all in Jesus' name.